We apologise for the poor quality of the following recording of a sermon by the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Although we have digitally restored this to improve clarity, the quality is not as good as we would like. We do apologise for this, but nevertheless hope that this sermon will be a great encouragement and a blessing to you. I should like to call your attention this morning to the words which are to be found in the 73rd Psalm and the 24th verse. The 24th verse of the 73rd Psalm. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Thou shalt, or thou dost, if you prefer it, guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. In order to facilitate our understanding of this statement, let us remind ourselves also of the previous verse, verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast hold in me by my right hand, and then thou shalt guide me by, by thy, with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. We are still considering the account which this man gives us in this psalm of his recovery, his spiritual recovery from that terrible attack to which he had been subjected, the temptation to doubt and to query and to question God's gracious purposes with respect to him. And all, you remember, in terms of the ungodly and the apparently good time they were having in this world, uh, you remember the circumstances. We are interested in the way in which the men recovered. He had almost gone. His feet had well nigh, his, his feet were almost gone. His steps had well nigh slipped. But he was saved, you remember, by that realization that to say that what he was on the point of saying would be at any rate a terrible hindrance to God's people, and that was something which was unthinkable, so he didn't say it. He was saved. And then, you remember, he began to recover as the result of going to the sanctuary of God. It's, it was there alone. He really began to understand things. And he began to see that he'd been entirely wrong in all his thinking. Wrong about these ungodly, wrong about God, and wrong about himself. And now we are engaged in the consideration of what he discovered to be so terribly wrong uh, about uh, himself. He saw that in harboring such thoughts in the very presence of God, he'd been behaving like a beast, stupid, ignorant, unintelligent, foolish. But uh, there it was, he had behaved like that. He'd thought these terrible thoughts, even in the presence of God, about God himself. And he has nothing which he can think of which is too black or too vile to say about himself. He condemns himself without pity and without mercy. And that is always an essential part of repentance. You can't repent truly without condemning yourself utterly. A man who's never felt that he's totally unworthy of God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness has probably never experienced forgiveness at all. To know the love of God means to feel utterly and totally unworthy of it. This man had passed through it. And yet, as we saw last Sunday morning, the thing he can't get over is this, that in spite of all that which is so terribly true of him, he nevertheless is still in the presence of God. Indeed, he's continually there. And he begins to realize that he's been there all along and the whole time. So now he begins to have an insight into the very way in which he recovered and the very way in which he was prevented from doing this terrible thing. And he sees that it's all the grace of God. It was God's grace that had covered him from beginning to end. And you remember, we began considering this biblical teaching with respect to the grace of God last Sunday morning. The, the general proposition is that salvation is entirely of grace. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's entirely grace. 
The glory is entirely God's for the salvation of every soul in every respect. The great formal principle of the Protestant Reformation, which we must never forget. And then we began to analyze uh, the biblical teaching with respect to grace, and it can be divided up very conveniently. Saving grace, the original, the first way in which grace comes to us, the forgiveness of sins, saving grace. But it doesn't stop at that, you see. We went on to consider, you remember, restraining grace. It was God who'd held this man back. He'd almost gone. Why didn't he go? Well, he thought it was the recollection of the harm it would do to the weaker brethren. But the great question is, what put that into his mind? And the answer is, God put it into his mind. God restrains us. It's a tremendous thought, this. It's a tremendous doctrine. God allows his children to wander very far sometimes, as I said last Sunday morning. So far are times that some people say that man's never been a child of God at all. But that is to misunderstand the doctrine of backsliding. God seems to let us go all the way, but he never does let us go all the way. He holds us by our right hand and pulls us back at the critical moment. It was God who held him, restraining grace. And then, you remember, we considered restoring grace. God brought him back and gave him. It was God who took him to the sanctuary. It wasn't... Uh, a mere idle thought that entered his mind and made him say, well, what if I go to the house of God? Not at all. It never works like that. And anybody in this congregation who's ever wandered away from God or who's been a backslider, if you examine your own experience, you'll find this, that uh, what you may have thought had come to you as a sudden impulse on deeper investigation was no sudden impulse at all. It was God who put it into your mind. He does. He manipulates in our very minds and thoughts. He'd taken the man to the sanctuary, and as the result of that, he had restored him. Well, now, that is uh, the point at which we had arrived at the end of last Sunday morning. But now, all that, of course, belongs to the past. He is still, as it were, looking back. He, he, he can't get over this. There's nevertheless this astounding thing. I'm still in the presence of God. God still looks on me and is still concerned about me. God's still interested in me, in spite of what I've just been doing, and in spite of what I almost did. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. He can't get over it, and he sees, well, I'm here because of God and God's grace. And then realizing that, he turns to the future. What's the future going to be like? And his answer is, the future is going to be the same. I am continually with me because, in the sense, thou hast held me by my right hand, and thou shalt guide me by thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Now, the first point which we must make in considering this is this, that this further step that the psalmist takes is one which is really quite inevitable in view of what he's already said. Now, my whole case this morning depends upon that proposition. My argument is that a man who has realized what the psalmist has realized about the past must of necessity and by an inevitable logic go on to say this about the future. So that if we cannot say what this man says about the future, it means that there is a defect in our understanding of the past. In other words, the Christian life is a whole. The doctrine of grace is one and indivisible, and you can't take out parts of it and leave others. It's either all or none. It's everything or nothing. So that I say that the man goes on to make this statement because, in a sense, he is bound to say so. He argues, I take it like this. I have been restrained, he says. I was held when I'd almost gone by the mighty hand of God as the result of his grace. I am restored. I am in the presence of God and now again enjoying the presence of God. Why? Well, because of God's restoring grace. But then the question arises, why has God dealt with me like this? Why did God restrain me? Why has God restored me? And there's only one answer to that question. God has done this because I belong to him. 
Because he is my father. Because I am his child. In other words, this isn't something accidental or fortuitous. God has done all this to me, says this man, because of the relationship that exists between us. And therefore, if that is true, well then he must go on doing that in the future. In other words, we are considering, whether we realize it or not, what is described as the doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints. Are we familiar with it? There has been no doctrine since the Protestant Reformation which has given such joy and comfort and consolation to God's people as just this very doctrine. It was obviously the doctrine that sustained the saints of the New Testament era, as I'm going to show you. And I say subsequently there has been nothing that has so held and stimulated and encouraged God's people. It's the whole explanation of the greatest exploits in the annals of the Christian church. He's not just saying, well, I, I feel sure, I have no doubt, but that uh, you're likely to go on doing what you've done, not at all. He's absolutely certain. It's a solid, certain assurance, as the remainder of the psalm explains at greater length and in detail. Now, this is a doctrine which is found uh, in the Bible everywhere. It is found in the Old Testament as it is found in the New. The Old Testament saints, all of them lived rarely in the light of this doctrine. It's the whole explanation of Abel, it's the explanation of Noah. Noah was a kind of monstrosity in the society in which he lived. They thought he was mad building an ark. It seemed so foolish. He wasn't like the other people, eating and drinking. Marrying and giving in marriage and so on and so forth, heedlessly and thoughtlessly. No, he was preparing for a catastrophe, a calamity. And why did he do it? And why was he thus ostracized? It was because he knew God and knew where he was going. And so on. Well, I needn't go into the details. There's a, a magnificent statement of it made in the 11th chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews. Let me just read to you the relevant verses. Verses 13 to 16 in the 11th chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, are a perfect summary of the way in which the Old Testament saints all lived. It's an explanation of their faith and of their philosophy of life. It is an announcement of the doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints. Listen. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And listen, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they had come out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is unheavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And they endured all that they endured as seeing him that is invisible. They subjected themselves to indignities. They suffered persecution. They were prepared to suffer death because they knew this. Very well, there it is in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, of course, it is, as we would anticipate, very much clearer. And it is clearer in the New Testament for this good reason that the Son of God has now been on earth and has done his work. And therefore we should have a greater assurance than the Old Testament saints had. They had it. I say ours should be doubly certain. The Son of God has come down and has returned. He has been seen, as John puts it, felt and touched and handled. We have all this evidence. Not only that, we have the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And the effect of all this should be to make us, I say, doubly certain of this glorious and sustaining doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints. In other words, the doctrine of sustaining grace is none other than this final perseverance of the saints. Or, if you like it, we can put it like this. 
In considering this doctrine, we are looking at the truth about the backslider in a positive way. Before, we looked at it in a negative way. In considering the restraining and the restoring grace, we said we are considering the position of the backslider. Well, now then, put that in its positive form in the future, and you've got the doctrine of final perseverance. Why does God never allow the backslider to go right away? Why did I say last Sunday that the backslider always comes back and must come back? It's because of the doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints. Very well. Let us look at this great doctrine together. What's the evidence which we have for it? Well, we've got this word we're looking at this morning, and it's one of the best. But listen to some of the statements of it in the New Testament. Listen to the Lord Jesus Christ saying this. You'll find it in the 10th chapter of John in verses 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any men pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, my friends, that statement in and of itself is more than enough. Those are words uttered by our blessed Lord and Savior himself without any qualification. They are dogmatic assertions, absolute assertions. They couldn't be stronger. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And as if to say, if that isn't enough for you, listen to this. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. But ah, oh, you say, what about certain other passages of Scripture? What about the 6th of Hebrews? And uh, what about the 10th of Hebrews? And what about certain statements in the 2nd Epistle of Peter? My dear friend, I'm more than familiar with them. But let me remind you, of a great state, a statement once made by Lord Bacon. I find that people who are uncertain about doctrines always prefer to have an authority which is extra-biblical. So let me tell you what Lord Bacon once said. The great Lord Bacon once uttered these words. Let not what you are uncertain of rob you of that of which you are certain. And what a profound statement it is. In other words, it means this, being applied to scriptural doctrine. Here now is a categorical statement made by our Lord, which is clear and plain. There can be no equivocation about it. That's an absolute certainty. Very well. You come across other passages which seem to be uncertain. What do you do about them? Do you withdraw this? You most certainly mustn't, says the Lord Bacon, if you're wise. Never let that which you're uncertain or rob you of that which you're, of which you're certain. Now, this is an absolute certainty. So you lay this down as an absolute proposition. You take your other verses and you look at them in the light of this. And if you do that, you'll find there isn't much difficulty. As I think I pointed out in passing last Sunday morning, the passages to which I have referred, none of them say that these people have been born again. Never forget that there are general common operations of the Holy Spirit. People may appear to you to become Christian. They seem to have changed their conduct and they subscribe to the right statements. It doesn't follow that they're born again Christians. It doesn't follow that they've received eternal life. They may have tasted of the heavenly gift. They may have experienced something of the power of the Holy Ghost. That doesn't say of necessity that they've received life from God. These have received life. And the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints applies to those who have received the life. Well, then, let me give you another statement. Take those mighty statements, which we read together from the 8th chapter of Romans, that inevitable sequence. Them he hath called, them hath he also justified, and them he hath justified, he hath also glorified. The Apostle Paul teaches there quite plainly that if God has justified a man, he has also already glorified that man. The whole of that portion is but a tremendous exposition of this final doctrine, ending with the ultimate challenge, who shall separate us? With the answer, nothing. 
I am persuaded. And what a weak word is that word translated. Uh, persuaded. It means I am certain. It's even stronger. I am absolutely certain that neither death nor life nor angels, etc., nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And another one. He says, Paul, to the Philippians, which have begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And then you get it from Peter in the first epistle, in the first chapter, verse 5. He says that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. And so on. We could spend the rest of the morning in quoting scripture. But on the basis of these statements, what exactly is this teaching? What are the uh, truths which here can be based upon this argument? How do we prove, how do we demonstrate this doctrine? Well, it seems to me that the teaching can be subdivided in this way. This truth is based upon the character of God. His unchangeable character. The gift and calling of God, the gifts and calling of God, says St. Paul, are without repentance. He is the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God's will is an unchanging will. It is an unchangeable will. Because God is God. What God wills, God does. What God purposes, God executes. The unchangeable will of God. It's the bedrock of everything. If I didn't believe that, I'd have no faith at all. It's the absolute utter certainty that God is. I am that I am. Everlastingly unchangeable and the same. In other words, God, unlike men, never starts a work and then gives it up. That's so typical of us, isn't it? We have our new interests, and we're all excited about them, we live for them, then we drop them. We all know people like that, it's in every one of us. You see a man and you tend to ask of him when you meet, when you meet others who know him, uh, what's his interest now? What's he keen on now? Because he takes up the thing and he's all out for it. Nothing matters, he's always talking, but you meet him in a few months and doesn't mention it. It's something else. We start, we forget, we get tired and we give up. My dear friends, God isn't like that. When God commences a work, God completes it. God is incapable of leaving anything half done or incomplete. Now I say that this is the bedrock of our whole position. God can never deny himself, says the scripture. He's never inconsistent. There are no contradictions in God. All is plain and clear. He sees the end from the beginning. That's God. If you don't rest on God's unchangeable will and purpose, well then I tell you, you've nothing to rest upon at all. The second argument I deduce is this, the purpose of God. Not only the character of God, the purpose of God. And surely there is nothing clearer in the scriptures from beginning to end than that God has a great purpose. And his purpose is to save such as believe. Now, you, you can't read the Bible honestly and without prejudice without seeing quite clearly that it gives you an account of creation and an account of the fall. And there is the whole of mankind in sin and in disgrace and lust. What is the message of the Bible? Is it not just this? To display God's purpose to save such as believe. Now I'm putting it like that deliberately. The Bible makes it clear that there are certain people who are going to spend their eternity in glory and there are certain others who are not going to do so. And if that isn't the gospel, what is you find it everywhere. This division, this judgment, this separation. God's people, those who are not God's people. 
It is God's purpose, I say, to save such as believe. And it's an unchanging purpose. It's a purpose that must be carried out. Why? That brings me to my next argument. The power of God. Now, obviously and clearly, this world is governed by a power that is inimical to God. He is described as the devil or Satan or the God of this world. And he has organized his forces with unusual ability and power and subtlety. And everything in this life and in this world practically is set against God's people. Temptations, suggestions, insinuations, the whole outlook, the whole way, the whole bias. Oh, I needn't describe it. It's all against us. And the question that arises obviously is this. Oh yes, you may say, here's a man who believes the truth. Here's a man who's a child of God. But how's he going to go through all this? How's he going to stand? Isn't he certain to fall? You read your Old Testament and you find them falling into sin. This man nearly went, David fell, and so on. Well, how can I be certain and sure that I'm going on to the end? The answer of the Bible is, the power of God, held by the power of God, sustained by this grace of God. Thou wilt hold me by my right hand. Thou wilt guide me with thy counsel. That's the only basis, the power of God. And of course it is a power which is invincible. It is illimitable. It is endless. And that is why, of course, the Apostle Paul, in praying for the church at Ephesus, you remember he prays three things for them. He prays that they may know what is the hope of their calling. He prays that they may know what is the riches of the inheritance of God in the saints. And this, that they may know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us with that believe. Even the power whereby he brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. Now says Paul to those Ephesians, that's what I'm praying for you. You are surrounded by difficulties. You are Christians in a pagan society. And I know you're having a terrible fight. The greatest thing you can ever know is this. That the power that is working toward you is the power that God exercised when he brought his son out from among the dead and raised him again. That is the power that is working toward us with the belief. You see, he's not content with saying it once. He repeats it. Everything that's in the Bible is worth repeating. He prays this that they may know that God's power is of this type, that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Same thing. Now then, that I say is the further deduction, the power of God. Oh, but my dear friends, I've got a much more powerful argument than all I've said. I've got something that is of greater practical worth to you and to me even than the character of God and the purpose of God and the power of God because we are so dull of hearing and we are so slow in spiritual things that those propositions seem remote and abstract and far away from us. I'll give you some concrete evidence in history. I'll give you a practical demonstration of all I've been saying. It's this. I'm going to introduce you to the very argument that this man uses in this 24th verse of the 73rd Psalm. I began this morning by saying that this man faces the future as he does because of what he deduces from the past. It sounds logic that. What this man says is this, the God who has done this for me and has done this in me and done this with me is going to do it. Very well, I use the same argument, but let me put it in its New Testament dress for you. Let's listen to it as the Apostle Paul says it. This is how Paul puts it. If, oh, I like that if. I like the logic of the New Testament. If, are you ready, logicians? Are you thinking, philosophers? If, while we were enemies, we were reconciled unto God by the death of his son? How much more shall we be saved, in brackets for certain, by his life? Can you refute that logic? You see what he's saying? If this almighty God sent his only begotten beloved son to bleed and to die upon the cross on Calvary's hill for us, 
Why we were enemies? How much more shall we be saved by his life? The God who's done that can't leave us now. He'd be denying himself. Having done the greater, he can't refuse to do the lesser. He must. But again, the apostle knowing us repeats it. And he repeats it in the 8th chapter of the epistle to the Romans in the 32nd verse. In that glorious statement we read together at the beginning. He that spared not his own son. Who didn't spare him humiliation. Who didn't spare him suffering. Who didn't spare him the spitting and the trial and the crown of thorns. And the agony of nails hammered into his holy hands and feet. He who spared not his own son. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Do you want anything further? If that isn't enough for you, I despair of you. The God who's done that for us is going to give us everything that's essential for our final salvation. It's unthinkable that he shouldn't. God's work is never in vain. If you believe what Paul says in the 15th of 1st Corinthians, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, well, very well, if that's true of our labor, how much more so is it true of his labor? But let me give you one final argument. The very way in which we are saved is a final proof, it seems to me, of the doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints. What do I mean? I mean this. You will have to work this out for yourselves. We haven't the time, unfortunately. We are saved by union with Christ. That's the teaching of the scripture in Romans 5 and 6. As we were all in Adam, so all were saved are in Christ. You remember the contrasts. Romans 5 and 6. We are saved by union with Christ. And I suggest to you that if you're ever in Christ and joined to him, you can never cease to be. You become a part of him. You are joined to him indissolubly. You are unified with Christ. The whole doctrine of justification proves it in the same way. God says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. We died with Christ. We were crucified with Christ. We have been buried with Christ. We have risen with Christ. All the still of him is true of us. Can that ever cease to be? And the doctrine of the rebirth, doesn't it teach us the same thing? We are partakers of the divine nature. Adam wasn't. Adam was given a positive righteousness, but he was not a partaker of the divine nature. He was made in the image and the likeness of God, but no more. The man who is in Christ, the man who is a Christian, the man who is born again, is a partaker of the divine nature. Christ is in him, and he is in Christ. Work out the logic of those propositions. If you believe those doctrines, see what follows inevitably from them. I can't understand people who say that a man can be born again today, then because of sin tomorrow, he dies, he ceases to be born again, he then repents and is born again, and ceases, he's born, he's dead, he's... It's impossible. It's monstrous. It is almost blasphemy to suggest it. You can have emotional experiences that come and go. You can persuade yourself of things that come and go. But my friends, I preach the activity and the action of God. And when God does a work, God does a work. And if you're in Christ, you're in Christ. If you're a partaker of the divine nature, you'll never lose it. It's impossible. Very well, there are the arguments, the truths that substantiate and establish this doctrine. Well, now then, how does God do it? How does God sustain us? Well, this man puts it like this. He says, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. Which means this, doesn't it, that he leads us, he guides us, while he does all that we were talking about last time. He restrains us, puts thoughts into our minds, 
not only that, he works within us. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, says Paul, for it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do. That's how he preserves his people. That's how he sustains us by his grace. That is how he sanctifies us and delivers us from sin. He works in us, in our minds and wills and dispositions and desires and so on. I'm hoping to preach on this very theme tonight. Or if you prefer it in the language of the Apostle Peter, listen to Peter. At the very beginning of his second epistle, he reminds the people to whom he is writing that they have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things. Everything that is necessary to living the godly life is given to us in the scriptures, in the Holy Spirit, in the presence of Christ. All things that pertain to life and godliness have been given to us. And by means of these things, God leads us on and sustains us and holds us and perfects us. He's dealing with us. We are his workmanship. And he's chiseling bits off us. You may be taken ill. It may be God doing it to you. We'll be reading it in a few moments in the communion service. For this cause, many are weak and many are sickly among you. And many sleep. What's he mean? Well, he says, you know, some of the members of this church at Corinth are ill and are sick because they haven't been examining in them themselves. They haven't been judging and condemning themselves. They haven't been repenting. They've gone on assuming, and God has had to deal with them through sickness and illness. Don't run away and say that I've said that every sickness and illness is the result of that. It isn't, but it may be. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourgeth every son whom he calleth. That's his process of bringing us and sustaining us to that ultimate. Let me end with it. What does all this process lead to? Well, according to this man, it leads to glory. Thou wilt afterward receive me to glory. Or if you prefer the other translation, uh, thou wilt lead me on after glory. And it just means this. If we are thus in God's hands and are being sustained by him, we arrive at a certain amount of glory even here in this world. Oh yes, even in this world we begin to enjoy something of the fruits of salvation, and that's glory. The gifts of the Spirit, the graces of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, that's all a part of the glory. When God begins to produce these things in you, he's glorifying you. He makes you unlike the world and its people. He makes you like Christ. And something of the glory of your blessed Lord belongs to you. You arrive at a certain amount of glory, even here. Celestial fruits on earthly ground, from faith and hope, may grow, says the hymn. Thank God it's true. Ah, yes, but this is only the beginning. That's only a foretest. It is indeed afterward we shall arrive at it perfectly. The glory that awaits us. All that is meant by heaven, all the glimpses that are given to us, a crowning day is coming by and by. A crown of glory awaits me, says the great apostle Paul. And that is why Paul, again, you remember, in those three prayers that he offered for the church at Ephesus, did pray, amongst other things, this, that they might know the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints. In other words, God is preparing us for himself. And the ultimate of salvation is this, that we just go and enjoy God's life with him. What poor creatures we are. What foolish creatures grumbling and complaining, holding on to things in this world. My friend, do you know that you and I, if we are in Christ, we are destined to enjoy the life and the glory of God himself? That's the glory that awaits us. It isn't merely forgiveness of sins. We are being prepared for that positive glory. That's the teaching. This man goes on to say it. God willing, we shall consider it next Sunday morning. That is the end and the objective to which God's sustaining grace is leading us and for which it is preparing us. But I imagine somebody saying, isn't this rather dangerous doctrine? Isn't there a danger of our going away from here this morning and saying, well, you seem to be saying, if I'm saved, I'm saved, it doesn't matter what I do. I've said nothing of the sort. If you can listen to the doctrine that I have been announcing this morning and draw that deduction, 
Well, then, I'm sorry to have to say it, but there's only one conclusion I can come to you about you. You've got no spiritual life in you. You are dead. The man who understands these things, says John in his first epistle in the third chapter and the third verse, reacts like this. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And regrettably there, we must leave Dr. Lloyd-Jones, as at this point, the original tape ran out. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.